Um, again, my name is Tanya Hertz. I am the executive director of the Rec Innovation Lab here at San Diego Miramar College. And then I'm also the program director for the entrepreneurship program here. And I teach entrepreneurship here and at San Diego State. So I have people here from a lot of different places. I see some of my SDSU students here, some of the Rec students, and then some, uh, some people from, uh, from the entrepreneurship community, I'm assuming. And Everyone is welcome. We love having you here. We're, we're grateful for you coming. Um, and we do workshops every week. And we're very excited about our workshop today with Helder. Um, Helder Sebastio uh, is a, uh, he's, he's a, a quintessential figure in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. We're, we're just uh, so grateful that he takes the time to help our, our little rec here, our community incubator, and help the students to, um, to really um, hone their ideas and, uh, and to create companies that, that are high growth and meet the needs of the customer. So we're grateful for everything you do, Helder. We're grateful for you being here, and we're so excited to hear, um, hear your workshop today. Thank you, Tanya. It's great to be here. I'm just going to get set up here in a second, hopefully. Perfect. I don't so, need the uh, the old people's technology service that was right. shown earlier. I'm yeah, not ready yet. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. We can see your screen now. We can't see your your notes on the side. So. Um, yep. Hang on. I will. Want. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. And then, uh, if anybody has uh, questions while we go, I'm going to encourage everybody to put the questions in the chat. If um, if uh, we will take uh, periodic breaks at the end, we'll leave plenty of time to answer questions. So, uh, so, so d don't worry there. Um, we'll, we'll get to them. And anything else that we needed to share, uh, Stephen or Helder? Just that yeah. if you take the the survey, there's a chance that you will win a gift card and a rec goodies bag by the end of the semester. And the more surveys you take, the more chances you'll have. Thank you, Stephen and Helder. You were you were going to say. Um, no, I'm ready. I'm just ready to go. Take it away. It's all. It's okay. All you Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a little technical difficulty, but I'm going to work through it. Um, okay. Good afternoon, Tanya. Thank you very much for the um, warm introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I really have enjoyed my time with the REC and uh, and enjoy and look forward to continuing. This being the first of hopefully many ways that I can. I can help this uh, the group do a great who does a fantastic job and and help you with your mission. Um, today's agenda is really three things. Uh, one is I'm going to give you a very with the time that we have, it's going to be quick and dirty overview of customer discovery. Uh, number two, uh, a core element of customer discovery is doing effective interviewing with. Uh, among others, prospective different stakeholders, and today we'll focus on prospective customers. So I'll give you some basic interviewing tips. And number three is once you collect these this data from these interviews, how do you sift through what you've heard? How do you make decisions based on that uh, on on that information that you've collected? Um, this session is primarily geared towards earlier stage startup founders. Um, however, um, I think if you're someone who is, uh, for example, uh, maybe you started your first sales and it's great. That's another part of customer discovery. But maybe you haven't really thought about uh, how do I how do I take advantage of those early sales to get more insight as to why people are buying and and um, who else should be buying from you know buying product from me. So uh, I think there'll be value for folks at that stage as well. And then for those of you that are recommendors or other, uh, other advisors in, the, in this great ecosystem here in San Diego, I hope there's some tidbits that you, that you get out of it as we go along. Um, I, my background is, uh, is, and I think what's relevant to my background today is that uh, I've, for about 25 years, I've been involved in innovation and entrepreneurship as a consultant advisor, managing programs and instructor. I was in academia for a while. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been really focused on uh, the, the areas of lean, uh, blue, uh, design thinking, blue ocean strategy, and effectuation, which is also referred to as entrepreneurial thinking and acting. I'm on the faculty of the National Science Foundation's i -Corps, where I learned where most of what you're going to hear today is extracted from is from their curriculum. And that's really teaching PhD 
uh, scientists how to assess the commercial viability of their discoveries. Um, but I have taught this at the community college level. I, I like to say from GED to PhD. So this is a, uh, even though this, this process kind of really started with software development, it cuts across a ton of different verticals uh, and is appropriate uh, process to use in, in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different ventures. I've been a mentor to hundreds of startups over the last 20 years or so, and perhaps most important for today, I'm a rec mentor uh, and uh, will be at office hours next week in a couple of weeks if you're if you're somebody who wants to take advantage of that. And also, I'm part I'm in the uh, the Rec Lab Connect network. And so you can find me there as well to schedule office hours if you'd like. And we'll put the links to those in the chat. So thank you, Hilder, for, for mentioning that. Thank you. Um, and the first question I'm going to answer, I have two questions for you. The first one I'll answer myself just for the sake of time. Uh, and that's, what is a startup? And I asked this question, one, to make you think about what it really means to be a startup, but two, just to kind of let set, level set for us as we go through this as to why customers discovery based on this particular definition of a startup. And, and to me, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. The two key words there are temporary and search. Temporary means you haven't figured it out and search means you haven't figured it out yet. And so a uh, when you tell me you're a startup, that means we're still trying to really figure out if we've got something here or how to, how to make this consistently repeatable uh, and scalable. Now this question I'll open up to the, to the chat and that's why do startups fail? So if, if people wanna quickly pop a response into the chat as to why do you think startups fail? I'd love to, I'd love to see what the, what the audience has to say. Okay. <laughs> Some, someone wants to get a gold star. They don't do adequate customer discovery. Thank you. Lack of access, missing target market. Great. No or minimal prep work. So you're all kind of uh, 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 around the edges of what the reality check is here. You know, if I asked this question about 10 years ago, it'd almost always be, it's a failure. Oh, well, we didn't do product development right. Or we didn't have enough money. We didn't have enough time is always the best one, right? And oh, if you only had another, another year to fail. Um, but it's really most startup, more startups fail from a lack of customers than from a lack of product development or a lack of money. Now think about that when you hear people talk about their company. Most of the time, unfortunately, they're talk, they start talking about the product and they're not talking about what they really need to be talking about, which is the problem they're trying to solve, for whom they're trying to solve that problem and why their solution is superior to that problem. The product should come at the end, not at the beginning. Uh, and so that's really the focus of customer discovery is, do we have, are we, are we um, going after a problem What's the problem we're trying to solve? Who are the customers who find this problem an acute pain and want relief immediately? Do we have a truly superior solution to that problem? And finally, can we solve that problem profitably uh, and make money from doing it? Um, and so this is right out of the, the, the Steve Blank, for those of you that know Steve Blank, the kind of the father of the lean, the lean launch movement and Eric Reese is the lean startup movement. And Eric was in at one of Steve's, Steve's classes at, at Berkeley. Um, the search for a viable business model starts with customer discovery, right? It's that very initial process. So the, well, I'm not gonna be talking about what's on the right-hand side, the execution, there's that's when you when you really have a sense of of an understanding of the problem the your product market fit then you can go ahead and build the company uh, but really we're talking about uh, do we even do we should we even exist should we even have a company um, and and I like to think of customer discovery at the macro and micro level and customer discovery at the macro level is really a four step process with that first step being stating your hypotheses, 
and I'm going to I'm going to uh, harp on this later as well. But really, if you're in a very early stage, almost everything that you are asserting about your company is a hypothesis, something that needs to be tested, put under fire uh, in the marketplace. But the again, the first thing you need to test is the problem. Do you have a problem that enough people care about in a way that would change their behavior to 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 try to find a, a different solution? Once you have identified that you have a compelling problem, then you can test the solution and to what extent your solution is so far superior that someone would want to um, adopt it. And then the the fourth step is as you go through this, and this is kind of, this is an iterative process, is do we pivot? to a different problem? Do we pivot to a different customer? Do we pivot to a different solution for the problem and customer who we've identified? Or can we proceed? Or if you've done a lot of iterations and you're still not really finding the spark there, do you punt and move on to something else? At the micro level, uh, customer discovery is done through a series of really quick and dirty experiments. And at the core of that, what I'm going to focus on today at, initially is interviews. But it's really, again, about test, formulating hypotheses. So we think our customers are women between the ages of 25 to 35 who have two children, uh, uh, have a career, uh, et cetera, you know, the, the, the details. And then you go and find, are those are those is that customer segment really who finds the problem the most compelling that you're trying to solve? Um, and as you go through this process, you're updating hypotheses as you get new information. You start Maybe you start talking to the women in this group and you find out, you know what? It's actually women who are a little bit older or women who are a little bit younger who are, who are the target audience. And so it's an iterative process that you go through. This uh, hopefully is familiar to, to many of you. If not, it's the business model canvas. There's also something called the lean canvas out there. I've used both. It, it really is kind of, you know, it depends on kind of the industry you're targeting uh, as to which is, it might be more relevant to you. But the bottom line is, uh, again, I'm just reemphasizing the point that at the very early stage, you're making a lot of guesses about the marketplace. You may have done your, your, you know, your secondary research and seen some things online, et cetera, that give you a gut instinct about who, what your business model should look like, but they're all, they're all, uh, they're all uh, guesses at this point that need to be tested. But what I wanna focus on today and really the essence of customer discovery is what we call problem solution fit. And then after that product market fit and really, do again, do we have 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 we synced up a problem in a customer segment with a solution and a value proposition of that solution that really resonates with the marketplace? Um, this is uh, the value proposition canvas, and it's from a book called Value Prop Design. Hopefully, you can see that. It looks a little blurry here, um, but um, essentially, the right hand side of this of this simple. Simple but powerful diagram is the problem, essentially the problem side, understanding the problem side of your customer. Your customer has a job uh, to do. For, uh, so for example, let's say the job is to buy a cell phone, right? To buy a, to buy a new mobile phone. There, and with that job for that customer, there are pains associated with buying, uh, buying a, a new phone, right? One of the pains may be uh, you know, finding something that's at the right price point for that individual. Another might be someone doesn't want to want to get a phone and be ha have to be tied to a particular carrier, right? And and the the, the costs that are associated with that. Some of the gains might be, hey, I want to I want to look cool with having the latest uh, technology uh, that that I can I can get in a phone. And so part of this customer discovery process is to, is to unpeel that onion, understand that customer, what's the fundamental job they need to get done, what current pains are associated with getting that particular thing done, and what are, they, what are they trying to really gain? What are they trying to realize out of utilizing this particular product or service and getting this product done? The left-hand side, the square, is the solution. And the solution really should be driven by the gains that you need to deliver 
and the pains that you need to alleviate. alleviate. And so once you know those gains that people want and the pains that people want to alleviate, want alleviated, you then develop your product or service. Now, if this sounds unusual, it's because it is, because where do we, where do companies, where do startups typically start? They start with developing the product or service and then work their way towards the circle, work their way towards the customer. I'm encouraging us and encouraging you to think about this, to flip this model and to think about the customer and the problem first then the gains that need to be in a particular solution and the pains that need to be alleviated in that solution and then develop your product from there. Uh, types of, of uh, pains that you can address, and these are all kind of, these are fairly generic, broad categories, but people, you know, the, you know people feel like they're wasting their time or their money or their effort. Um, people who lack confidence, you know, the, I, 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 I was uh, just, partially joking about the, the, the team that is developing the services for older folks about using technology, but that's a lack of, that's a, a huge pain for that audience is a lack of confidence um, in, in using technology. So a solution that reduces that barrier for them is going to resonate with that group. Um, benefits, performance, qual you know, better, better quality, better performance, reducing hassles and obstacles, and then there's the financial and social, and, and there, there are potential risks, right? So back to my cell phone example, one of the financial risks in buying a new cell phone is getting tied into a two-year contract or a three-year con two-year contract that you no longer want to want to be a part, uh, be with that carrier, and then you're going to have to pay a penalty, right? And so one obviously one of the ways to 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 address that concern and that risk is to offer um, no contracts, right? And of course, a lot of carriers are doing that now. And gains are things that make, you know, cre create, you're, you're giving them additional time. You're delivering more of something or less of something. And in other words, less, it's, it's less time consuming or there's less steps required to, to complete something. Uh, the, 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 the folks that are trying to match the, 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 the restaurants that have excess food with folks that could use that food, that's trying to reduce what could be a very complicated um, a supply chain process to make to simply you know something that people can use a phone to identify you know use an app to identify uh, the the, uh, the where the food is and and where the excess food is and and who and who could benefit from that excess food, um, flattening making things easier except more accessible right faster better cheaper is is kind of the the shorthand that we that we look good that we look at. Uh, this last bullet, I just want to highlight a little bit because making people look good or product or giving them an increase in power and status, these are, if you have deliver this kind of gain, these are the people that are most likely to be your evangelists, right? Because you've really put them in, in a great position and they're going to want to tout the success that they've had utilizing your particular product or service. Okay, I'm not going to go over this in detail. This, this is something that's out of the value proposition design book. But it just says that when you are talking about uh, your particular venture, you ought to be thinking uh, in terms of uh, not just the product, which is the, that first blank there, but for whom specifically are you delivering the product? What job are you addressing for that customer? What pains are you reducing for that customer? And what gains are you delivering? And how is this unlike what's already out there in the market? Um, in terms of testing the problem, I've already said, you know, the, the who and the problem. I think the key, the, the two key things here is number one, is it a pain versus an inconvenience? I don't care what you're selling and how complicated or, or uncomplicated it is. Ultimately, you're in the behavior change business. You're asking people to stop doing what they're currently doing and utilize your product, utilize your service and stop doing what they're utilizing, whatever they're using now. If it isn't a pain, you know, and, and think of your own experiences, right? There are things that annoy you in your everyday life, but don't always compel you to seek a different solution. Pains are things where if somebody came along with something better, boy, I jump all over it. So how sufficient, how unhappy, one of the things you want to extract when you're doing customer discovery is exactly how unhappy are folks with the current solutions? And ultimately, are there enough of them? Um, and so it, this is really, 
ultimately customer discovery is about having what I call intentional empathy. And that means really putting yourself, instead of this being about you and what you wanna sell, it's about them. It's about your customer and what they're going through, right? What are their big, and, I, and I, I will say that some of the videos did this really nicely, right? They talk about the pains and frustrations of their customers in that in in uh, every in dealing with the particular product or service that they're trying to to, to provide. Uh, so what are the biggest frustrations and pains? What are their goals and aspirations? And how important is success to them in completing the job or not failing? Right? Um, if you're a parent uh, of a young child, sometimes the fear of failing at providing some particular product or service to your child is almost as strong or if not stronger than the fear of looking good in, in, the, in the eyes of other parents, right? In terms of what you've provided. Um, who or what influences what people think and feel? And then why, why? And I'll talk about the five whys a little bit more later, but it's like really understanding what motivates and compels people to do what they do. This is an empathy map. This is a very basic version of an empathy map that helps you kind of think about the different influences and the, think of the customer as a, at the center there of what they see that influences them, what they hear from other people and from media and social media, uh, what they think and feel about certain products and services or jobs that need to be done and what they say and do. And from that you extract pains and gains. To me, the essence of understanding empathy, the empathy map and the empathy process is that your job is to identify the fundamental painful conflict that the customer is dealing with. And I'll give you a couple of examples, right? Uh, number one, I don't know anyone other than maybe Olympic athletes who would tell you that they feel, they think they eat healthy all the time, right? And maybe there's even Olympic athletes who are just so keyed up that they, they'll tell you the same thing. Uh, and so everybody says they want to, almost everyone says they want to eat healthier, yet behavior suggests that they don't follow through. And it's not necessarily a flaw in the personality of the individual that this conflict and this gap exists. There are hurdles, there are pains that are associated with that. Um, when I was with Target, we did a lot of work on young families and dinner around dinner. And dinner is important to, to, to parents because it's, it's one time in the day working parents because it's the one time in the day where they actually get to gather as a family and catch up with one another. And so there's this conflict. I want to have, I want to have nutritious dinners, but I also don't want to spend the whole night cooking, cleaning, and prepping. And so how, do, how can you uh, bridge that gap between what people's aspirations are and what their reality is? And the, and the other one is, of course, green. People, you know, everybody... I, I, every presentation I see around green technology says everybody's eco-conscious. Yes, everyone's eco-conscious, but not everyone is acting on that. And it may, and again, there may be barriers, right? There, uh, for example, hydrogen-fueled cars is a problem. There's a lot of problems associated with hydrogen-fueled cars. One of the most acute being the lack of, of uh, sufficient uh, outlets for fueling your car. People actually returning the cars because They've had to be towed so many times in the middle of driving their vehicles. So the, the key takeaway here is the, the, key, the element, the, the, the nut of customer discovery is finding that conflict and understanding whether or not you can bridge that conflict, bridge that gap with your solution. Uh, in terms of testing the solution, it really comes down to, does the customer think, does this percent prospective customer think you have a better mousetrap? Do you, do you have something that will move the needle and move them to, to, uh, to, to change their behavior to use your product or service? If you don't, you've got a non-starter. If it's a nice to have versus a must have, you're in, you're in, you're in deep trouble. Um, and, and also, will they tell other people, right? And especially early stage companies, you want to find these evangelists who will help you with promoting the product. Okay, so that was a very quick and, and dirty overview of, of customer discovery. Um, and now I wanted to just give some quick tips on, on interviewing. 
Um, and the, as you can see, it's, I'm going to talk about how to get open, do an interview, close an interview, the reflection process. And you can see it's because it, interviews, again, are an iterative process in, in customer discovery. Um, who to target for interviews? Well, start with your hypothesized target customer, right? So who do you think is the customer? Talk to those people. Don't talk to friends, talk to strangers. Can anybody in chat tell me why that would be uh, something you'd want to do? Talk to, to strangers and not friends. All right, we're getting a lot of responses of, of unbiased uh, or lack of bias with the, the strangers versus the friends. Yep, great. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. You got it, right? Friends um, uh, will, will tell you what you want to hear. Strangers tell you what you need to hear. So ensure that you're talking to people who don't, who don't want to uh, hurt your feelings, right? You want your feelings hurt and, and when you're doing customer discovery. You, you want to hear the harsh realities because the, the, the interviews that save you from those years and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars of misery later are really important. It's important to get that tough love early on. And also avoid experts. Uh, unless they give you direct access to target customers. So you might want to talk to me because I worked at Target and I've, I've got a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, if you're targeting families and I've done this research. And I mean, I'm one data point and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just, this is just an amalgamation of different, uh, different information that I've collected. You need to have that firsthand connection and talk to these customers yourself about your particular problem that you're trying to solve. It, 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 there's a tendency to, to think that, oh, someone wrote a report on this and it's kind of sort of tangentially related to my market, so I'm going to treat this as gospel. No, go out and talk to, directly to the people who you think are going to be your customers. Um, how many interviews? I'm going to give an unsatisfactory answer. It depends. But I will say that at a minimum, it usually takes about 30 to 50 interviews to sort of things to start clicking in about whether or not a customer segment is a customer segment, whether or not the pro you're really solving the right problem or it's, a really, it's really considered a pain versus a nuisance. I will tell you that in the i -Corps program, you're, you're, a lot, you're required to do a minimum of 100. Most teams do a lot more than that. Teams that, go th that do customer discovery, uh, companies that do customer discovery and continue to do it, uh, throughout the, the, the early stages of the company, they've done as many as 500. So that just kind of gives you an, a sense of the range. But I would say, you know, minimum 25 to 30 initially, just to give you a sense of whether or not there's a there, there. Um, in it, some, some tips, face-to-face -face interviews are best. And of course, uh, this, I, was, I was doing this last year when, when we were in the midst of no vaccines and all, and all of that. Um, video chat, Zoom is okay. What we found with Zoom is that people are a little bit um, quicker on the draw. You know, they, they've, you know you, they, they penciled you in for those 10 minutes on Zoom and, and when the 10 minutes are up, you're gone. It's a little different sometimes when you do face-to-face -face, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, email interviews where someone says, oh, well, just send me questions. That's a survey. That's not, a, that's not an interview. That's not an interaction. You want to have a conversation with someone. It's not fill in the blank. Uh, and, sur and surveys in general are not a substitute for interviews. The surveys are, are useful in two, two uh, specific areas of customer discovery. Very early on, if you're just trying to get a sense of, your, of what, who the customer might be and what problems they may have, that might be a useful tool to kind of do some very general sort of hypothesis generation. And later on, when you think you have nailed down the solution, the, pro the you have problem solution fit, you might use surveys to find out things like specifically where they'd want the product to, you know, to, to purchase the product, price points, things of that nature. So, but for, for the core customer discovery, surveys are awful. They just don't give you the kind, they, they're yes, no, and there's no why. And, and customer service is about really understanding the why people behave the way they do. Um, if at all possible, team uh, interview as a team of two where one person's doing the questioning and listening and the other one's taking notes. 
Um, I know that that's sometimes difficult. So whenever possible, if you're just doing it by yourself, ask the person you're interviewing if you can record the, the session. Um, in terms of setting up interviews, uh, and this is kind of geared more towards the people in the rec or the, the Lavin program, but you know, playing the student card is really, really does open up doors. Who doesn't want to help a, a, you know, a hustling student who wants to, who wants to develop a, a, a business? Um, but again, with, when you're setting up the interview, make it about them. You want, you know, butter them up, tell them, hey, really could benefit from your insights about what it's like to solve this particular problem in your daily life. Um, ask for 10 minutes and get 30. And what I mean by that is if, if you interview someone who gets uh, engaged, they will forget that, that, that we only had 10 minutes of time, right, to do the interview, and they'll, they'll continue on. If you ask, these days, if you ask someone for 30 minutes, that seems like a huge chunk of time, right? Given how busy we all are, 10 minutes seems manageable. So it's just a little, a little trick. Uh, if you can get warm referrals from people, that's perfect, right? You know, so-and-so suggested that I contact you. So leverage your mentors um, to, to help you with, with that. Um, in terms of opening, again, uh, acknowledge that, that you're, that, that you know that their time is precious you appreciate it and tell them who you are what you're doing and that you're there to learn you're not there to to, to you're not there to teach you're there to learn right you're there to learn about them you're learning about their situation their problem how they solve it currently what they what they're what they like what they don't like about it etc do not sell don't even even don't even describe your product Right again, this is not about you. And once you make it about the product, it then becomes a value judgment, and you're going going to go. You you didn't learn any real insight about the customer. You only learned whether or not they they may say yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down to your product. Selling comes way down the line. This is about understanding, getting a deep understanding of the customer, getting a deep understanding of the pro what they see as pains and the hurdles that they see in in solving those solving those particular problems. Let them talk. Um, you're there, to, again, you're there to learn from them. And, and what I'm showing here is it's not a, it's not a job interview and it's not a, it's not a date. It's a conversation. The best interviews are a conversation where it doesn't even feel like it, it's an interview where you're just kind of rolling with rolling along. An essential element of doing interviews is asking open-ended versus yes and no, yes, no questions, right? So uh, for example, if I were, if I were, if I were trying to develop a new product that's going to compete with, you know, um, uh, the, in the, in the um, rental uh, 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 travel market, right? I wouldn't say, hey, uh, would you buy a product that did this, this, and this? I would say, uh, let me, uh, tell me what it's like to, to uh, plan travel these days. Oh, you know, and, and then they, they'll give an answer and I'll say, well, why did you say that? Could you explain what you mean by it's kind of a hassle? Oh, so it's, it's um, so if I understand correctly, you're saying that uh, oftentimes information is kind of all over the place and you don't, and, and it makes it really hard to, to find the right, the right uh, uh, property to, to rent and things of that nature. Why is that? Well, and and what, have you, what have you tried? And why didn't they work out for you? So it's really um, about them explaining to you the challenges that they have and using the five, the five whys to really drill down to the nut of the matter. Um, oops, excuse me. Listen to learn. So we, we have a saying in, in i -Corps, be a fox, not a faucet. You have two ears and one mouth, and you ought to use them at least in that ratio when you're interviewing. Uh, again, it's not about you. It's about prompting the individual you're speaking to to share with you their challenges, their frustrations, what they would like uh, to see better out of a, doing a particular job in their life. When you close an interview, the, the most important thing that you can do ask is, what else should I, what else should I've asked you? What have I, what else would you like to tell me before we wrap things up? Right? Because they may have 
they may have a, a burning issue that you didn't even think about asking them about that they raise as a result of that. So it's great, great potential insight. And then ask for a referral. Who else do you know that I should talk to about this? Um, when, how am I doing on time, Stephen? You have about 20 minutes left, give or take. Does that include Q&A or that exclusive? Without the Q&A, 20 Without minutes left overall. Fantastic. So then we'll, we'll go ahead and use, the, um, use the, this time. I'd like to uh, select a couple of volunteers who uh, would be uh, willing to interview or be interviewed. See how we can make this work out. So if there's someone who would like to interview someone, if someone who has a venture, who would like to do get some practice interviewing or you know, has a startup and like to get some practice interviewing. I can't believe I would think that lots of people would be jumping at it uh, to, <laughs> you know, to, to have their, their, um, uh. their startup worked on. I think this is a great, this is a great opportunity to, to work on your startup. All right, work on your idea. Okay, well, maybe we'll circle back to that and see if we get some some people that uh, are brave enough later. Um, yeah. This is the first time no one has volunteered, so. I know, I can't believe that. I would have thought so many people <laughs> could jump in. All, so all they don't have to, all they need to do is, is uh, you know, they don't have to have it figured out. We'll figure it exactly. out together. Exactly, yeah, yeah. We, were, yeah, we just help them out. Okay, well, let, we'll, we'll circle back maybe during and see if we get anybody to volunteer later. The, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, so you've, you've, uh, you've had your hypotheses, you've done your interviews, and how do you collect and, and sort of draw insights from the, the interviews that you've done? Oops. Uh, so, the, you know, the, part of this is, is to really be a little... Um, uh, direct in, in how you manage your, um, your record keeping. So you should at minimum sort of uh, identify who, you, who, you, who conducted the interview, when the interview happened, who did you speak to. A picture uh, is a great thing because it, for a couple of reasons. One, face, you know, when you see a face, you, it helps you kind of remember, oh yeah, I remember we, we had that conversation at the coffee shop and they were going on and on about, you know, how, how much they hate haggling on a, on bu when buying a car, that kind of thing. So pictures are great in sort of helping with helping you with recall. And also these pictures will be useful for you, potentially useful for you later on when you are developing pitches and you're giving, you're talking about who your target customer is and you've got pictures of folks you actually talk to and say, here's Bill. Bill's a retired so-and-so who wanted to, you know, whatever. So Picture, it's always useful if, if they'll allow you to take their picture. If they don't, don't push it. But if they'll allow you, please, I encourage you to do that. Um, and any other contact information, you know, what, you know, where they, what any uh, things that are relevant in terms of their background that would be useful, again, for you later on when you're describing your target customer to describe them in a particular persona. Uh, why did you interview this person? What were you trying to what were you trying to talk about at that at that uh, point? Um, are they a buyer? Are they a user? And and frankly, these terms would be is kind of a separate workshop in terms of the different types of customers. Um, but uh, is it were you talking to somebody who's inside a company uh, or someone or someone who's a consumer was a B two B or B two C that kind of thing? Um, what were your hypotheses going into the interview? What did you learn? And what's next? And Here's a couple of examples of ways to record that information. Um, this is something that the slide just I developed at one point, and this is actually in the um, value proposition design book. It's a form to use for, um, again, capturing that information. We, you know, my our hypothesis was that uh, the the customer is. Uh, that the customer thinks that convenience is the most important, uh, 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 the, the thing that they don't have right now in terms of buying this particular product or service. 
when in interviewing, we observed that actually it was price that was that was the most uh, most burning issue for them. Uh, and therefore, we will do some more interviews around price to see if this this is really is a significant issue. Um, and and as you when you're when you are entering this data, and let's say you've done fifteen or twenty or done your twenty five to thirty interviews, then look at the results and say, okay, what common themes, what patterns am I seeing pop up? And it's not only what you heard, that's important, that's really important, but just almost as, as important is what you didn't hear. What, what did no one mention that you're surprised that they didn't mention? And why, why was that the case? And if you don't know the why, go do some interviews to find out why. why. Why is convenience not that important to these folks? Is it just a given or is it that is it that it's not that it's not that much of a hassle in the first place to do this particular job? So I'm not interested, you know, it's not a it's not a deal to me. So when you are looking at your interview summaries, not only focus on the things that pop out as this is what people kept saying, or a lot of people said this, but what's missing? What people didn't say that you expected them to say? Um, and what needs additional exploration? So you know, you may, if you feel uncertain about what the data is telling you, then go do some more interviews and find out, okay, I, I think the people are saying price is, is more relevant than convenience, but let me go ask a few more people just to be sure uh, that I'm right. And one of the, 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 the real takeaways from this process is if you're not surprised or disappointed, you're probably not learning. You are just trying to affirm your beliefs that you had right from the get-go. Uh, and, and you're not really embracing the process. You should be surprised. You should be disappointed. Um, you should be taken in directions that you didn't expect to be taken in as a result of, of this process. And that, that we call that confirmation bias. And there's a little video I'd like to show you that's a perfect example of confirmation bias. And this is, if you recognize Jim Carrey here from the movie Dumb and Dumber, some of you may, may remember this scene. And I hope the audio works. It's Fingers crossed. It's a classic. You have to share your audio, Helder. <clears throat> okay. so if you click on more at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little, uh, those three little buttons. Yeah. Um, share the audio that way, yeah. Share sound. Got we it. Do have, we do have a volunteer too when you when you're ready. Super. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me bring it back. What do you think the chances are of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> no, Jim, there isn't a chance, right? So, um, so that's kind of, that's kind of, and, 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 you know, it's funny, but we all kind of fall into that. Uh, you know, we hear what we want to hear and not what we need to hear. And customer discovery is definitely about what we need to hear. So, and, and, um, and now that we have a volunteer, I, I just, I'm not going to necessarily ask you to, to share this, but I just want you to think about your biggest takeaway, because I know that um, you're, you're being asked to provide feedback later, kind of what's the biggest takeaway from today's session, but also what's a concrete action item that you're going to take in the next few days as a result of this session today, whether it's, you know, identifying people to interview or clarifying the problem you're trying to solve or whatever. I hope that, that this has um, um, motivated you to, to kind of take some action. So I understand we have a volunteer. So uh, Daphne, um, <clears throat> Daphne was uh, willing to volunteer. So uh, thank you so much. She's one of the, one of the uh, REC student founders. So um, Daphne, if you uh, wouldn't mind turning on your your video, if you can. I'm on. Oh, okay. there you are. Hi, Daphne. Hi, good to see Hi. you. It was my view. I couldn't see you there. So, so Daphne, don't. I'm assuming you want to interview someone, correct? 
Uh, I'm not really sure what I want to do. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, uh, well, I would, it would be easier for me to be interviewed, but um, if you guys need well, me to interview someone, I'll go, I'll I'm go gonna, with the I'm flow. Gonna, Tanya I'm going to have, help. I'm going to have you interview someone, but all right, what all I, right. what I want, I don't want you to do right now is tell us what, what the, the venture is. Okay. But if you could tell us what kind of person or what kind of job or the job that that person needs to get done, you'd want to talk to, like, do you want to, like, who do you, who would you like to talk to? I would like to talk to either college students or parents of K through 12 students. Okay. Do we have any college students on the line who would, who would, I'm, I'm hoping since college this is. Students or, or parents of K through 12. I'm sure okay, we have college our, students. Yeah. College student or K through 12. This is painless. I assure you, we will not, we will not be posting this on social media and mocking you or anything of that nature. We have somebody, can, we, can we have a, a college student? Just uh, let us know, raise your hand. Let us know if you'd be willing to talk. Oh, or a parent of K through 12. Great. Michael, I see Michael's hand up. Perfect. Yeah, I'm a college student, <laughs> I suppose. Okay. Aren't we all? Okay. Right. Okay, great. So um, we're going to do this. So, so Daphne, uh -huh. um, based on the, um, what you heard, I want you to just proceed with, assume that Mike, Michael has agreed to, uh, to interview, be interviewed by you. Okay. Alrighty. And you're, you're at Starbucks somewhere at, at a Alrighty. Starbucks, right? Uh, and you're just sat down and are about to interview. And, and Michael, can you turn your camera on so we can see your, so she can see your facial reaction? Great. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm at work right now, but yeah, hopefully oh. that's oh. working. <laughs> okay. Hi, yep, we, we can Hello. see you. Okay. okay. So I'm going to give you like two or three minutes. I might jump in at, at every once in a while. Don't be, Daphne, don't be uh, thrown by that. It's just, this is, we're not grading, we're helping. This is just to sort of give people a sense of what the, what it, the process should look like and, and um, so kind of give some tips along the way. So you've sat down, begin. All right. Hello, Michael. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me. Um, I understand you're a college student. Where, uh, where are you studying? I'm currently studying in Miramar and uh, not a problem. I'm happy I could help out and show up here today. That's great. Uh, yes, Miramar. And uh, do you, have you selected a major? Yeah, I'm a business major, actually. Fantastic, uh, yeah. fantastic. Business is a great major. Well, so within that business major or within any of your courses, um, my question is, how would it make you feel if you knew that you could learn anything? Um, it would make me All right. feel I'm gonna inspired, call time. I I'm suppose. going to call time here. I, sorry, I'm going to call time out here for a second. Anybody have a comment on the question that Daphne just asked? I do. <laughs> Mike, go, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I already feel like I can learn, learn anything, but. Okay. Um, any, anybody else you can type in the chat? I like that she's getting at the emotions. Okay. okay. So it was a little, a little broad. Yeah. A little broad. It was a little, no, broad is fine. Mm -hmm. it, it almost sounded like you were trying to lead Daphne. It almost sounded like you were trying to lead Michael towards a solution as opposed to really understanding, uh, making it about him. Okay. Right? Okay. So how can you ask a, so he told you he's a business major. Mm -hmm. How could you now make it a question that's about him and what it's like to be a business major? Okay. Um, so as you approach your studies in business, um, are there, are there any times that you feel like you could use some learning assistance? Are there, are there struggles that you have within any of your courses? Um, specifically with the courses, no. It was a little bit, um, the platform, just learning the, the ins and outs of Canvas was the biggest struggle. That's kind of broad. It's not related to the, to the major. Um, specifically with the courses for the major, I, I currently do not have any um, issues with with learning them or any technical problems 
Okay. Okay. Um, so Tanya says still leading a bit. Um, yeah, I guess I need work on that. I don't, I'm, I don't think I was, but. <laughs> That's okay. But, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, everybody's first few interviews are going to be rough because we're having to unlearn these, these behaviors of talking about the solution or trying to lead people to solution. But so uh, hey, Jack, Jacqueline asked the points for, for, for yeah, just doing absolutely. this. Good Jacqueline job. asked uh, asked a great question for you to pose. What what are your pains as a student? Or you know what are and and maybe we wouldn't want to use the vernacular that we use as you know pains and gains. But yeah, you know, how, how might you ask that question? What are your pains as a student? Um, what's the most difficult thing you face as a student? And I think he already told you, right? And you said yeah. he said the technology, might, right? Technology, right now you're probably thinking, well, I don't care about that, right? Because that's not what you, is that what I, what I, I would surmise from you? Well, it's not that I don't care. It's just, it wasn't what I was expecting. So that's a, that's a really good point. Um, but technology is involved in our um, company. So, okay. So, but, and so then the, if he tells you that can, he's having a problem with canvas, What's the magic three-letter word you can you can ask? Why? Yeah. Why is it a problem? So why is Canvas such a hassle, Michael? Um, mostly because I am a new student as of this year, uh, returning back after a long time away from school. But um, the main reason is because every single professor sets up their their uh, page differently. Like uh, some of them put everything in the modules. Some of them put a syllabus with links and it just seems very uh, scattered, I would say, at least from my experience. Uh, for fortunately, enough of them do it relatively similarly, but I've had, I have, I have one class right now where it started two weeks ago and, and there's not even published information on campus yet. So I don't even, <laughs> it's like the assignments are popping up like the week before they're due. And I don't even know how that's fair, but uh, I guess that's a one-off. But I always just say just the variety of how the platform is used um, and trying to figure out each one for each class. Um, again, but that wasn't a huge struggle. It's just one of the uh, technical issues I've faced. Now, now Daphne, if, if this is, and, and we're going to uh, cut this off and I, for the sake of time, but I want to thank both of you for, for stepping up and volunteering. But if this, if this, this is going to happen, right? People are going to bring up things that may not necessarily be in your uh, bailiwick or what you're, what you're interested in, in talking about. What you do is you acknowledge and say, oh, that's, um, that's a really uh, significant problem. I'm sorry you're having to deal with that. I want, and you could redirect by saying, I wonder what other hassles you might be encountering that, that I could learn about, right? So okay. you don't have to get, get stuck on that track if that's not a track you want to pursue. Right, but, right. But you don't want to be leading. You just want to sort of say, okay, thank you for sharing that. What else would you be willing to share this share with me? You know, what, what, other, what other issues are you dealing with, right? So that you can eventually get there. But you may find out that Michael... You may ultimately find out after the interview that Michael's not your guy, right? He's that you thought the college student, this college student's not it, right? So that that's part of the 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 discovery. You may not find out. You may find out. Well, maybe this isn't as big a pain as I thought, right? Or or maybe he's just not. He, maybe the, the not as big a pain for him, right? And maybe maybe the, somebody else that that you need to speak with. Or, yeah, uh, right. Which so is which is good, right? That that shows that I'm. Don't select a person with similar credentials or similar background as me for the next interview, which is exactly. good information anyway. Because you may, because maybe, you know, in, maybe that, oh, you know what, can't, tying this to Canvas or you know, maybe that's something we ought to be thinking about, right? It, now, maybe not, but again, the, these kinds of real world curveballs that you get thrown actually might be opportunities to consider other, other uh, avenues, right? Of, of development. So yeah, thank yeah. you both. Right. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to open it up if there were any questions. Um, I'm all ears. <laughs> that was such a great, thank you. Thank you so much, Elder. That was such a great interview. And um, thank I, you. I love that because <clears throat> I always feel like no 
no interview is wasted. There's never a wasted in interview. You always learn something. And uh, yeah, that was a really great exercise. I've, I've never done anything like that. Um, so, and also thank you for the volunteers. So yeah, questions from the audience. I have a question for Helder sure. um, because he obviously didn't want me to say, you know, what our company is or does. Um, but so what what we're doing is we're a fully online tutoring and coaching service. Um, and so we want to serve college students who are having trouble with learning in various courses and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Mike wasn't the right student because he's obviously not struggling with his courses in, in the way that we would be able to serve him. I mean, yes, I know about Canvas. I could probably help him with that, but right. that isn't really what, you know, what we're trying to provide. Um, and, and so, you know, going back to what you were talking about earlier, your whole model, um, to me, it seems like it's very related to products and not as relatable to services. I'm trying to figure out how do no, you do I, customer Yeah, I, I would, I, I think, I think what your issue that you brought up is more about screening. So you could do a, pre, you could just do a simple screen and say, um, you know, I'm looking to talk, talk to students who are having difficult, some sort of difficulty in college, right? Or, okay. you know, ac okay. ac ha having academic difficulties in college, right? You, okay. Maybe if you know counselors, they might be a source uh, for those folks. So you're, you're, it's, it's really not that it's a product or service because this, trust me, this, I've seen this used across a lot of different uh, product services experiences. It's, it's more about screening for the, you know, the, and again, we were doing a quick and dirty here, here but um, screening for the, uh, for the right customers, right, the right initial target customers. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, then, I um, probably want to schedule some time with you in the in the rec um, to yeah. maybe talk about this further. That would be sure. great. I'd be happy happy to do so. Ale Thank Alexandria you. had a question. If a startup doesn't have an expansive network, how would you recommend they find interviewees at the beginning of their venture? Well, I think one of the things that folks kind of kind of underestimate is the is the, that they do have a network. They and and if uh, if you're in LinkedIn, go on to LinkedIn, and it depends on who you want to talk to, right? If you want to talk to college students, you shouldn't be telling me that's a problem because there should be ways to, and, and I'm not telling Daphne problem. I'm saying if you're a college student wanting to talk to college students, you should be able to tap into that network. If you're trying to talk to business people, again, LinkedIn and see who you're linked to that could make introductions for you. Um, and, and you know, even though you don't want to interview friends, friends can certainly help you with identifying people in their networks that can um, that you can, you might be able to talk to. So I hope I answered that question for Alexandria. Yeah, she did say uh, thank you. Yeah, that's great advice. And and just so everybody knows, you can also expand your network. Connect with all of us on LinkedIn, right? If it's not big now, uh, let's let's make it bigger, right? So um, do we have time for one more question? I think we're pretty much over on time. So Helder, is there anything that you would like to uh, leave us with? I see that you've put your LinkedIn there. Thank you so much. Yep, just, uh, yeah, just a reminder that um, I am, uh, I'm a rec mentor. And so, and I, I'm not gonna be here tomorrow uh, on, during the office hours tomorrow, but the following week, the 22nd. But again, you can also find me on the network. And uh, I've, I have a calendar there for, for office hours outside of the typical rec hours, rec office hours. I'm happy to, to work with you. Uh, and again, I, I guess the, you know, I always say, what are the three things you want people to walk away with? I guess number one is it's about the problem. It's about them and not you, first of all. Number two, it's about the problem and not the solution when you're doing customer discovery. And um, if you're not surprised, you're probably not doing it right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if you remember anything, remember those three things, right? And good luck. Uh, and it's a, it's a great journey. And it begins with these conversations that you have with, with people who you ultimately want to serve. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again, Helder, so much. And all of you, I'll remind all of you, if you'd like to uh, see a copy of this workshop, you can uh, go to our YouTube channel at the Rec Innovation Lab on YouTube and add, find this and other workshops and uh, go to our Eventbrite and see if there's other workshops that you'd like to attend. This is a 
amazing workshop. We really appreciate it. And we have lots more to come over the year. It's good to see everyone. Thank you and have a great rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Elder.